Coming up, the ethics of the internet age. I'm not a, a, a God believer, but if I believe in justice, if I believe in that order of the universe, uh, then I'm going to try to help people see those patterns. Present Shock author Douglas Rushkoff discusses the dangers of technology, the Occupy movement, and TV's evolution. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Good evening. I'm James Traub, and welcome to Carnegie's Ethics Matters series. Our guest tonight is Douglas Rushkoff, who is the author of Present Shock, When Everything Happens Now, a work that I would say cements Douglas' status as the Marshall McLuhan of this age, the age of internet and social media. Uh, Douglas is a ludicrously productive and protean figure who, at least by my count, has written 17 books, including Life Incorporated, How Corporatism Conquered the World and How to Take It Back, Nothing Sacred, The Truth About Judaism, Ecstasy Club, a novel, three graphic novels, and my favorite Rushkoff title, Stoned Free, How to Get High Without Drugs. He's also the author of three PBS frontline documentaries and innumerable articles and, and blog posts. So Douglas, thanks so much for being All here. All right, thanks for having me. Uh, so it's clear just, I think, from the litany of those titles that a very deep ethical strain runs through your work. There's a kind of deep sense, I, I think, of the kind of harms that are done to us by so much of modern life. So maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about your background. Did you grow up with a deep sense of the harms done to people by modern life, or where did all that come from? Funny, when I was little, my older brother went to Hebrew school, and I was still in kindergarten, but I wanted to do the things my older brother did. He went to a Sunday school, and my dad got me in as a kindergartner into the first grade Sunday school class. So I was this little kid. And and um, a new rabbi came in, and uh, he started coming to each class and saying, ask me any question you want. Judaism's about questions and all. So I, um, I asked him, I said, so, you know, what is God? And, you know, it's like, <laughs> King, this is where you might as well get the answer, right? This is the place. Um, and I was five. I figured this is what we're paying for. Um, <laughs> And he goes into this thing about, you know, there's this sense in you between, you know, right and wrong, and you have this natural ability and all. That's God. So I was like, what? You're saying God is your conscience? And he's like, yes. You know, he's, God is your conscience. God is your conscience. And he started going to each of the classes and saying, God is your conscience. God is your conscience. And um, so kids went home and said, oh, the rabbi says, you know, God is your conscience. And, and a month later, he was fired. <laughs> <laughs> did you hold yourself responsible? I did. Yeah, and I, did. I have to this day. Yeah. I decided that, that it's almost like a, if someone dies, you want to then live for, for them. <laughs> I decided that uh, at, really at that point that I would, I would live to help, um, help people see the, the, that sort of innate order of things, you know, that there is, that there is uh, uh, a natural uh, ethic that's, that's beyond social construction. You know, There's justice out there. There is, yeah. you know, and maybe, that's a, maybe that is an essentially Jewish take on things. You know? So no, I'm not a God believer, but if I believe in justice, if I believe in that order of the universe, um, then I'm going to try to help people see um, those patterns where they exist to connect those things so they can then live in a way that feels like they're in, in consonance with that and try to work against the, uh, uh, the structures and the, uh, really the social constructs that uh, hide that from people. So you know, my sense is that e though we'll talk about media and media technology, because that's what your book is about, there's some broader theme here about the loss of personal agency. Uh, despite all the liberatory promises of modern life, so that we think it's all going to be better, 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 and in some uh, semi-noticeable, understandable way, our personal agency is being sapped. Is that the kind of how you see a lot of this stuff? Yeah. I mean, I was a TV kid, so I was raised in a receive-only media universe. <laughs> the future that we imagined when I was a kid 
was one like on Star Trek where they're looking at the universe on a TV. I mean, they're basically sitting on the bridge watching television. <laughs> um, so so it, was, it was just bizarre. So then I had my first exposure to digital technology. And I had to save my very first file. In the old days, everything was sort of mainframe, and you just had terminals. I had to save a file. And it asked me, do you want to save this as a read-only file or a read-write file? I was like, what does this mean? And they explained, oh, a read-only file means other people can look at it. And a read-write file means they can look at it and change it. Oh my god. You know, and I realized I'd been living in a read-only media universe. And now we were stepping into a read-write media universe. But then when I looked out you know, at the New York City streets for the first time with read-write consciousness, I realized, oh, the grid pattern, that's not city. That's a city that we chose to make. And there's other cities that they made other ways. That, that money is a read-only medium. Why is it a read-only medium instead of a read-write medium? Because they'll throw you in jail if you try to write your own money. So all of these things, all of the things out there that were accepted as sacred truths or, or inviolably you know, legally defended uh, truths, to me, were all suspect. So in a way, this is when you became conscious of media as media, as opposed to just a kind of unthinking vessel through which you would see whatever it is you were eager to see. Right. Yeah. And the way that the uh, and whether or not media were open to human intervention or whether they were accepted at face value. Did you? And when did you read McLuhan? After. Um, it's funny. I read McLuhan after I wrote this. Uh, I wrote a book called Media Virus, which kind of launched that whole viral media thing, and I was responsible, but not. Um, because they, they, they turned that into viral marketing, which isn't what I meant. I meant that there are these um, uh, cultural agendas that end up getting expressed through viruses because we have certain, certain sort of collective um, immune deficiencies that, that can be exploited by, by, by information and ideas. But um, I wrote that, and this publication, Nathan Gardle's thing called New Perspectives Quarterly, they said, oh, the brilliant heir to Marshall McLuhan. I'm like, yeah, they keep talking about, I better read this guy, you know? <laughs> so um, I shouldn't think of him as being an important shaping influence on your thinking. Later he was. Yeah. Later he was when I decided to apply some discipline. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're going to write the, the next 10 books, you know, <laughs> you've got to have a little, a little discipline. And that definitely helped. I mean, and, and for, for me, it was understanding uh, media as environments. You know, the idea that a light bulb creates a, a media environment that now you can write and it's different. And I try to extend it beyond just media. So what's the environment created by central currency? What's the environment, you know, created by the automobile? How these new technologies create different environments around them. And once they're so well embedded in the environment, you accept them as given conditions rather than as inventions. You know, and that's sort of where my the sadness about the digital thing happened, because for me, Digital technology was like LSD. It was like, oh my god, it's a read-write universe. We're constructing reality. And uh, then I see kids today, you know, they'll use uh, uh, Facebook or, or WordPress or uh, a digital technology, and it's the equivalent of taking acid in the ACDC parking lot. There's like no, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no insight associated with it. They accept it at face value. They'll look at Facebook and say, oh, this is the way I make friends. This is what it's for, and we know you know, Facebook's not there to help kids make friends. It's there to monetize a kid's social graph. And they, you know, surrender themselves over to it and accept it at face value without what I thought would be, um, I thought it would happen. I thought anyone who used this stuff would get turned on. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that a time would come where not only would people not apply the digital sensibility to money and Judaism and politics and all that, but they wouldn't even apply it to digital technology. In present Shah, you're also saying that there is a diminishment in, in all this. I mean, I think you use the expression that, that when you define this expression, present shock, a diminishment of anything that is not happening at this moment right now. Uh, and so explain what well, you Well, a diminishment you, of everything that, that, that is happening now and surrendering it to everything that's supposedly happening now. So what's happening now is we are in this room together. You know, it's not that my Twitter feed is pinging at me. You know, this is a faux now, right? This is the fake now on the device. It's, it's distracting me from the moment I'm in. Because the moment I'm in, and this is where I get kind of Marxist about it, the moment we're actually in can't be marketed. It, it's, it's not a market phenomenon. Whereas every time we're creating data with our device, we're contributing to, to the churn. But there's also some fundamental loss of attention. I mean, you, you point out that, that 
um, let me see if I, I want to say this the correct way, that being of the moment is not the same thing as being in the moment. Absolutely. I mean, and because we're chasing a we're chasing a now that doesn't really exist. I mean, it goes back to sort of my uh, second initiation with digital technology was in the in the late '80s when the internet came around, and a lot of us, I mean, I was a, I graduated college in 83. It was the, the beginning of the slacker era. And the slacker, the idea of slacker was not to be lazy, but to have time to do cool things rather than getting some yuppie job and punching the clock and giving your time to the man. So the computer came around, and me and my friends thought this would be the great harbinger of Slack, because now you know, we could work at home, very interesting. online, in our underwear, in our own time, produce the thing, and no one will know how long it took me to produce it. If I can write a 500-word article in half an hour and charge 500 bucks for it, you know, gig is in, right? I mean, this is all this is all good, uh, but. In, instead of using these technologies in that way to create more time for us, you know, Wired Magazine and the other friends of the NASDAQ Stock Exchange looked at the internet as a way to um, keep uh, uh, dying markets going, you know, to somehow recover from the biotech bust of 1987 and use the internet as the new poster child for the ever, you know, ever expanding marketplace. They wrote articles about the long boom, how we're going to keep growing, and technology is going to let this thing happen. You know, and they ended up looking at human attention as the new commodity, you know, because they couldn't extract stuff from the third world anymore. There was no more developing world labor to, to enslave, so it's going to be our eyeball hours, and that's what they called it. So we developed what was called sticky websites that would keep people attracted attracted to them longer, you know, stuck glued to these, to these uh, websites, spending their eyeball hours. And we naturally moved towards, rather than having technologies that we could use in our own time in asynchronous ways when we wanted to work and then make more time for real life, we strap the devices to ourselves and have them ping us every time someone Facebooks us or tweets us or sends us an SMS. And we live in this state of, of perpetual emergency interruption. You know, which is the, 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 the state of consciousness that was endured by 911 operators and air traffic controllers and only for a few hours a day. And it does have this deleterious effect on our ability to contemplate and our nervous systems. I mean, we think our phones are vibrating in our pocket even though they're sitting in the other room in this it's a syndrome you know, called phantom vibration syndrome, <laughs> right? Which is not a, an appropriate response to a technology, right? This is maladaptation. So you talk about the fact that the things that people might not have thought of as being technologically determined, like, for example, the rise of reality TV as opposed to those older forms you and I grew right. up watching. So I explain how it is that this technology winds up shaping all this, these forms of cultural content. I went to theater school for graduate school. And I did theater until I became disgusted with Aristotelian narrative. You know, the idea that you create a character the audience likes, that character makes a series of decisions um, that put him into some kind of danger, and then, you know, finally when the audience can't take it anymore, at the top of the Aristotelian plane of tension, the character, you know, finds a gun or a method or a change of heart or a recognition and reversal, and then, ah, you know, this sort of crisis, climax, sleep model of narrative, the sort of male orgasm curve uh, uh, <laughs> structure of narrative that we've had for 2,000 years and has led to all of these false ideals and, and, and it ends justifies the means journeys and the eyes on the prize nonsense um, that, that keeps us out of what we're actually doing and allows us to do unethical things now because we're getting to the, we're getting to the top of the thing. And um, I couldn't find another uh, at least for that medium, I couldn't find another satisfactory narrative structure other than weirdo, experimental, you know, Richard Foreman-like stuff that nobody really wants to see. I saw the way that this narrative structure was abused on television, you know, with a 30-second commercial, the girl gets the pimple, she wants to go to the prom, you know, we've got to go up the inclined plane of tension, she pops it and the blood comes out, horrible thing, she puts the wrong stuff, until finally you get, you know, 25 seconds into the commercial, she finds the clearasil, she puts it on, <laughs> colors go through her body, and she goes to the prom, everything's okay, right? So I have to accept this imposed state of tension by the sponsor in order, you know, in order to make it to the end. And 
in, in when I was a kid before remote control or in my father's day, you know, you've got to watch this commercial and experience this anxiety, or you've got to get up from your chair, walk up to the television set, turn the dial, adjust the rabbit ears. It's a don't worry about what they were. Uh, the television <laughs> used to come through these things into it. Um, you know, adjust the rabbit ears and sit back down and watch something else. I mean, what are you going to do that? Are you going to change? Once you have a remote control, which for me was the first interactive device, now you can get out of that imposed state of tension with you know, 0.001 calories of effort. Right? Bam, you're there. Bam, you're gone. Bam, you're gone. It felt to me, at least at the beginning, that the remote control helped you deconstruct the content of television. So now you were no longer watching a television program. You were kind of watching the television. Certainly when there was just a dial of 13 or 20 channels, you could kind of, remember you can get around the whole thing, still know where the game is, know where you are in law and order, and watch this weird movie. You can kind of get to all three and make your way around it. And you can watch the TV. It was sort of like when William Burroughs would cut up the front page of the New York Times and readjust it and say, now we'll see what the paper really says. You know, it was sort of, that's the way I felt about television, that now we're watching the TV or the, the Nintendo joystick, which if you remember the first time you played a video game, probably Pong, you know, and, and you, you were moving the pixels around on the screen. It demystified the, the, the magic of the monitor, and then finally the computer keyboard and the mouse, which turned it into this do-it-yourself medium where it was a portal, it felt to me like these digital technologies changed our relationship um, to this stuff, or potentially did, where the content wouldn't be as uh, uh, rhetorically manipulative, the, the medium wouldn't be as mysterious, and the, the broadcast directionality of it would be overturned by a peer-to-peer uh, a, a -peer multi-directional network. You know, but it didn't, it didn't finally come to pass. You know, using the remote like that was called ADD, and we drugged our children to pay better attention. You know, the, the demystification of, the, of the, the, the monitor was remystified with, you know, how do you install a program in Microsoft? You, you summon the wizard. You know, why would they pick the wizard? It's not the helper, it's not the maid, it's the wizard, because now this is, you know, oh, stay back, you're gonna damage this thing if you play with it. And the, the, the interactive revolution, this, this, the possibility for peer-to-peer -peer connection became the information revolution. It was about downloading who can get more, more songs off Napster than who's going to actually contribute. And, and one of the other victims of this was this Aristotelian thing that you had such right. little regard for, which in fact is what made up television until recently. Right. And I, but I am not upset that we've lost Aristotle, or at least that Aristotle has lost his exclusive. Or that we've lost I Love Lucy. Yeah, or that it's lost its exclusive claim on narrative. What television had to do was adapt. So you get The Simpsons, where you have a show that's less about will Homer get out of the nuclear power plant in time you know, before it blows up, and much more about what scene are they satirizing now? What commercial are they satirizing? What's this? On the, the more modern end of the spectrum, you get Game of Thrones, which moves like a fantasy role-playing game. We don't really care so much how it ends than watching this thing keep going. It's what James Cars would call an infinite game. We're not playing it to win. We're playing it to see where it goes. The Sopranos ended by just cutting to black in that great existential moment with no climax, as if to say we're kind of done with that. That's not the way life works. It's no longer... Uh, it doesn't work with our experience so, but these anymore. Are, these are actually the kind of wonderful, ones. charming, creative uh, adaptations to right. a world where it no longer makes any sense to think in Aristotelian yeah. terms. There, yeah, but there's the, the, the darker side would be reality TV where it becomes really about creating, you know, if you don't have a narrative, if you don't have a goal, the only thing that kind of energizes you is terror. You know, and that's what those shows are. It's 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 kind of violent humiliation of other people. You know, we watch. It's a, it's really it's a horror show. I take it something like Fox News or talk radio, which is so violently emotive and impulsive, uh, as opposed to the sort of gently droning, ponderous newscaster of yore, is another example of same, right? That yeah. too is you're going to gravitate towards the sensationalist. You know, if you're flipping the dial, flip 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 flip, oh there's someone getting killed. You know, oh there's someone, you know, if you're if you're moving through it, it's going to be those moments. And that's why we see this sort of race to the bottom in YouTube. It's tricky without a, without another context to sort of guide us. And that's sort of where what we didn't uh, what I thought we would naturally allow another context to emerge, a more human-centered one, 
um, we didn't. And that's really what the book is calling for, is that if we, if we return to the now, we can have human intervention in this. You know, but instead, I find that the, the, my peers, you know, the greatest other kind of cybery thinker people of, of my generation are looking forward to the day when computers surpass humans. They're talking about the singularity and they're celebrating Watson. And I'm fine with Watson. God bless him. He's a smart computer. But <laughs> it it's, doesn't herald the day when computers become smarter than us. I mean, I read a, a book like James Glick's The Information, and what I see is him telling the story of information's evolution towards greater states of complexity. As if information was here before us, information evolves through atoms and biology. Now it's evolving through human culture. But the day that computers can evolve, to, can evolve information better than humans, then we're only important insofar as we can keep the machines going. And that has the medium and the message reversed. It's important to note that in Douglas's book, uh, he talks a lot about the counterweights and, and possible solutions to all this, though it, one might feel in reading it that the critique is more persuasive than the solutions are likely. But so you mentioned Occupy, for example, and in the book you talk about it as a, a post-narrative movement, a, a movement that in some way is adapted to this world. So talk about what you mean by that a little bit. Well, you know, I felt like there were two immediate kind of political reactions to post-narrativity, you know, to where we no, can no longer have a campaign. Right, we had Obama, and he was sort of like the last great campaign. Follow me on this journey. We are the change we've been waiting for, which is such a presentist sentiment. We are the change we've been waiting for. It's like, it happened now. And then he got there, and it felt like, oh, where's the invitation? Where to go? Where do we go? Where do we meet? And I felt like there were these kind of two reactions. One was the impulsive present shock reaction, which would be the Tea Party, which is like, we want our change now. You know, just get rid of this. Get rid of the government. Just give me stuff. Um, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, there was that, which is the, the angry, impatient child, and then there was Occupy, which was kind of infinitely patient. So we're no longer going to be about reaching uh, the conclusion. You know, when, when they got interviewed by you know, Fox or whoever would come down there and they say, so what is it going to take for this thing to end? The occupiers would say, well, why does this have to end? We're not looking to end this thing. Well, what do you want? What are you demanding? Well, we're discussing that. It was a difficult movement to embrace, you know, certainly as an adult. But if you saw what they were doing was they were saying, look, this sort of left, right, winner takes all debate oriented politic doesn't work anymore. That's about getting an answer that half the people are going to like. You know, and instead what we're going to do is sit and develop new mechanisms through which consensus can emerge. So it seemed to me a, a style, a, a sort of a post movement politics that was presentist in that sense, and that they wanted to reach consensus, and it was an open-ended, iterative, uh, you know, iterative process. It was much more like the internet than it was like a book. And, um, and I, I'm still very hopeful. I don't look at the Occupy as over. Maybe it's over by that name. But I look at it as sort of the beginning of a new style of uh, much more um, incremental uh, and even locally based change. The fact that these were live sit-ins, if you will, they were live gatherings of people, kind of reified um, the human, um, human dimension and human scale in a political process that's become as big as, you know, kind of corporate brands. So, and are there maybe one or two other examples might be good of other cases where you see a sign of a kind of positive post-narrative adaptation to what is otherwise this rather destructive world? For me, the biggest change has been um, becoming aware of kind of basic chronobiology, you know, the basic uh, r rhythms of our biology. Just you know, day and night, the recognition that shift workers get more cancer than other people. That that there are these um, rhythms that that are we've evolved with biologically for however many hundred thousand years there've been people. And if you become more aware of when is it day, when is it night, what season are we in, or get more advanced, and it starts to sound new agey and weird, but it's really basic, but what phase of the moon are we in? You know, it turns out that people's neurochemistry changes based on what week of the lunar cycle you're in. Realizing things like that, I mean, I started, I wrote Present Shock 
with that schedule in mind where I understood which weeks I could work and which I, which I couldn't, I became way more coherent. Then I start looking back at ancient Jewish lunar calendrical cycles and what was going on there, what aboriginal cultures understand about these things. Um, without even having to delve so deeply into the science and understand it, you find out, oh my gosh, there's so many really easy landmarks for how to uh, uh, reorient yourself temporally um, to really be on your game rather than at the mercy of these, um, you know, this punch the clock um, existence. But you're saying these are also intrinsic limits even to this uh, aspiration to turn ourselves into human forms of our machines because the fact is our body imposes organic limits on us. Our body imposes or, or offers organic opportunities to us. Yeah, okay. You know, I'm glad the bed stops me from hitting the floor, right? And it's a boundary condition, right? I mean, yeah, and that's fine. We are finite beings, you know, and that is okay. There's gonna be a death someday. The body has its edges, you know, and I think that's, that's fine. You know, the universe is not infinitely expanding, and neither are we, and neither is our economy, and neither is our time. You know, there are finite, there, it is finite, which is why we as humans have to intervene on our own behalf and choose what do we want to do with, you know, the time that we have. Well, I think that's a great place to, that was a, a beautiful <laughs> closing moment. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.